Prophecy is a good line of business, but it's full of risks. So said Mark Twain, a very wise man. And he's certainly right about electoral prophecy, or what people like me call election prediction, election forecasting, so it doesn't sound like hocus pocus. When Mark Twain said that, it was actually legal to bet a lot of money on elections in Wall Street. 1932, the election that pitted Franklin Roosevelt against Herbert Hoover, you would have gotten 7 to 1 odds in favor of Franklin Roosevelt getting elected president. That's about 90% certainty. So the market expected Roosevelt to win this election, maybe no surprise, given the terrible state the country was in during the Depression. So money was involved, big money, uh, no limits. And this was something that uh, occurred for almost 100 years, uh, that you could do that. Can't do it anymore. There are special niche sites where you can bet small amounts of money. Also, election prediction was uh, big business for newspapers and magazines, the media in those days. You may have heard of this one here, the Literary Digest. Digest was a magazine that in election years, presidential election years, would mail out millions of postcards to households in America. On these postcards that looked like a paper ballot, you could mark your preference for a presidential candidate. So in 1932, it would have been Roosevelt, Hoover, maybe some third-party candidates as well. And then people would send the ballots back, checked, uh, probably or perhaps with an indication that they wanted to subscribe to the magazine. It was a, an advertising gimmick for the digest to gin up business, to get people then to sign up for the magazine, etc. And so they got the postcards back and they would tabulate them and uh, then s see what candidate was the winner and they would post that in the newspapers, etc. 1932, they got it right. They picked Franklin Roosevelt, and they'd been right pretty much for several elections until then. But four years later, 1936, the Literary Digest did the same thing, got the ballots back, tabulated, and said, yes, there'll be a landslide. But it was a landslide for the wrong man. It was a landslide for somebody you may never have heard of, because he sort of sank into oblivion after that, Elf Landon. Republican of Kansas, a Republican candidate. He didn't win in a landslide. He lost in a landslide. Very bad landslide. Franklin Roosevelt won one of the biggest landslides in American history. That was bad news for the digest. You make a prediction, all right, risky business, very risky, and the digest went out of business after that. Never did it again. No more election forecast from the digest. All right. Don't despair. The same year, a new kid on the block came around to do election prediction, George Gallup. George Gallup invented scientific polling. Polling a large population like the American electorate with a sample designed to be representative. He had much smaller numbers. He only had about 3,000 people. The Digest had 2 million. So size doesn't always matter. Not, not how many people you get to respond, it's the kind of breakdown that you have that has to be representative uh, to, to um, get you a good result. So this is what Gallup uh, produced in 1936. You can see in Gallup's polling, Franklin Roosevelt was ahead the whole time. Never trailed. Uh, the lead got bigger and bigger, and at the end, he won. So Gallup felt pretty good about having gotten into the business. This was his debut, first time he, he did this. Um, he kept doing it. Next few elections, did pretty well. And then came 1948. You may have heard about 1948. All right, 1948, who did he have ahead? 
except maybe one poll early on in January, a man by the name of Tom Dewey. Thomas Dewey, governor of New York, Republican candidate, was leading Harry Truman, sitting president, who was trying to get, well, sort of reelected or elected. He succeeded Franklin Roosevelt, and Franklin Roosevelt died. And as you can see, the final Gallup poll, the prediction was Dewey beats Truman. Everybody believed that. Everybody but one. There probably was only one person <laughs> in America who didn't share that belief, and that man was Harry Truman himself. You might have seen this uh, picture. Well, it's not doctored. All right, it's Chicago Daily Tribune. In those days, that's how it was called. Now it's just called the Chicago Tribune. Chicago Daily Tri Tribune, or the writers, or the editors, or the owners, they were so convinced that Harry Truman would lose and Dewey would win, they didn't even wait for the ballots to be counted. They went to press, convinced, okay, Truman lost, Dewey had won. All right. The paper was so embarrassed about it, you can imagine, they tried to collect every copy of that issue, of that edition, and burn it. So nobody would ever know about it. Well, they didn't succeed. Uh, he has certainly one copy, Harry Truman. And if you ever go to a, a Truman Museum or Library, uh, Independence or Key West, Florida, where he has a little White House museum, you will see in display, on display, this particular issue of the Chicago Tribune. One of Harry Truman's happiest moments in life. He had beaten not only Tom Dewey, but he had beaten the Chicago Tribune, which hated him. Uh, and uh, so, incredible vindication for him. So, what happened? What went wrong? Um, social scientists got together, formed a commission to investigate. They wrote a 500-page report, still worth reading. And one of the things that they, that they noted in this report is that Gallup, and there were a couple of other pollsters, simply stopped polling in the middle of October. So already, maybe two weeks ago, they stop polling. They say, all right, this time Hillary Clinton. Let's say it's done, done deal. Uh, waste of money, time. Nobody wants to learn anything more. So in those days, they said, it's, it's in the bag. Well, what they didn't reckon with was Harry Truman's whistle stop campaign that in the last two weeks of the campaign produced a surge of support for him that turned the tide. And that's evidence, too, that, uh, that we have. So. Big mistake that the poll pollsters made in stopping polling before the election day. They would never do it again. They would poll and poll, and as you know right now, you watch uh, some of the sites uh, every day, more polling, more polling. This will go on until next Tuesday. They will actually poll still on election day to give you what, they, what they're finding. Is that the answer? Is that the solution to the problem of polls Getting it wrong, all right. Well, look at this picture. Now that is a doctorate, pi this, is a <laughs> this is not a real thing. I don't think uh, Obama actually posed for this picture. And the Chicago Tribune today certainly wouldn't be called the Chicago Daily Tribune anymore, it's just the Chicago Tribune. So this is a very nice uh, play on the old Harry Truman poster. And uh, what does it say? It says, Gallup, Colon, Romney, 50, Obama, 49. That was the final Gallup poll, the prediction made by the Gallup poll four years ago, that Mitt Romney would be elected president and defeat Barack Obama, and we know it didn't happen. Okay, another case like Dewey defeats Truman, didn't come true, Gallup didn't get it right. After all these years of being in business, he didn't get it Right. It was close, you have to admit. It wasn't by, I don't know, five or ten points. But that hurts. And it hurts so much that Gallup decided after this mishap, soon after that, not to go to business. Gallup is still in business. But to quit this kind of polling. Gallup would no longer do polling to make a statement about how people plan to vote, like a vote prediction. So if you, if you look now at Real Clear Politics, or one of those sites that summarize uh, poll results, you will not find Gallup anymore. Gone. The gold standard of polling has thrown in the towel. 
So we don't know what's going on anymore, and we don't want to take a chance. We don't take the risk to be wrong. All right. Fair warning, but being fixated on the polls and thinking it's all done, and you know the winner based on that. All right. What else is there? What can I tell you about how to predict elections if it's not by polling? Well, I'm a political scientist by training, so political science. I think I take the science part very seriously. So let's begin with something that's really scientific, that comes from the world of science, and see whether it can tell us something. Take a look at this chart. All right, nothing to do with politics at all. All right, sunspots. Sunspots up and down for about 200 years. Somebody recorded that, some astronomer, and it has uh, intrigued statisticians and mathematicians to see whether they can figure out the kind of law that generates these kind of cycles. They're not easy to model because they're not regular. All right, they don't always have the same width, uh, their length is different, etc. Very big challenge to mathematicians and statisticians. All right, now look at this. This is politics. These are elections. This is the result of American presidential elections for 200 years, 1828 to 2012, the last one. It's a percentage of the Democratic vote of the two-party vote in presidential elections. All right. And you would agree with me that just thinking back at the picture you just saw, there are also cycles going on. They're a little bit less regular, more irregular than the sunspots, but there are cycles. There are probably about 10 or 11 cycles. Take your finger, trace it through, etc. And so if you find a way to get to the, to the heart of that and, and get a handle on, on what the nature of those cycles is and how to, how to capture them mathematically, then you can make a forecast about the next election based on the cycle, just as you could do with the sunspots. And in fact, I have used the same statistical algorithm that a British statistician invented, so to speak, for the sunspots in the 1920s. Uh, so using that particular technique, I can make a forecast with a precise number about what is going to happen in the next election. I'll hold that until a little later when I tell you about something else. But the fact is, elections in the aggregate, not individual voters, behave over time in a way that is a little bit analogous to something in the natural world. So we're not maybe that far off to the world of physics and astronomy as we sometimes think when we think, well, politics, I mean, who knows, it's totally unpredictable, every race is different, every candidate is unique, etc. You can't really generalize, etc. Well, I beg to differ. And I think if political science is serious about the science, then we have to differ. Now, you will also, I will also agree with you that if I want to give you a prediction, I have to say something about the election year itself, something that happens right now in this year, not just maybe something that happened in elections for 200 years. And American politics has something called presidential primaries. You may have been part of it. You may have voted in one. If you're a New Yorker or lived somewhere else, you probably had a chance to vote in a presidential primary. Uh, many of my colleagues probably uh, will not know how long America had presidential primaries. Uh, it's actually quite a, quite a long time, not quite to back to 1828, not that long, but to an election in which these two candidates squared off against each other. You may recognize one, maybe, maybe both, both of them, all right? Woodrow Wilson on the left, holding the hat in hand, and next to him, William Howard Taft, the Republican also the sitting president. This is 1912. The 1912 presidential election, we see for the first time a large number of states conducting presidential primaries to pick the nominee, whether it would be Wilson or Taft. Well, something interesting happened uh, in both parties' primaries. In the Republican presidential primaries, William Howe Taft, sitting president, was challenged by somebody who wanted the job as well. Actually, it had the job before, Teddy Roosevelt. 
good friend of his in the past, but now a rival after, Howard, after William Howard Taft's job himself. So Teddy Roosevelt challenged Taft in the primaries. Wilson also had some challengers. And so what you see when you look at the results of these primaries, on the Democratic side, you see Woodrow Wilson winning the battle, not close, not, not by, a, by a landslide. He beat somebody by the name of Champ Clark. So Woodrow Wilson is a primary winner. On the Republican side, look at this. William Howard Taft is a big loser. He is beaten in a humiliating fashion by Teddy Roosevelt in the primaries, very badly. But does Teddy Roosevelt get the nomination from the party at the national convention? The answer is no. The party stuck with William Howard Taft, the primary loser. So now, what happens in the general election? You have a battle between a primary winner, Woodrow Wilson, and on the other side, a primary loser, William Howard Taft. Who wins the general election? Woodrow Wilson, the primary winner. So, primaries, 1912, nobody noticed it at the time, are a predictor of the general election. And so when you go through the, all the elections since that time, which I've done, all the way to the, to, to the present day, you will find invariably that the candidate who has done better in his or her party's primaries will beat the candidate who has done worse. So you have to compare strength in one primary with strength in the other primary. So that's a very good predictor. And I think it is a predictor because you are testing how candidates are performing. Now, it may be a little bit like saying, we just had a World Series, that the team with a better record in the regular season uh, beats the team with a less record. I think, from what I recall, the Chicago Cubs actually had the better record in the uh, uh, general season, regular season, so it may be true there as well. But this is, a, this is very good because it also is much earlier than the election, so you have months after you know that, to make a prediction. You have to wait until a day before or a week before the election. I see I'm speeding up a little bit. So <laughs> New Hampshire, a very special case. Uh, first state, and first state uh, holding primaries is something that I've put a lot of faith in. And combining the pendulum, the cycle, and the primary performance has given me predictions that were right in five out of those five elections I picked the popular vote winner correctly in all of those. This is what I've tried. This is all that I've applied the model to, so I'm not hiding any elections that I, I did where I missed it. And so, for the election that's coming up in about two or three days, my forecast, Donald Trump will be the next president of the United States because the pendulum is swinging his way. He was the better candidate in primaries, and I'm out of time. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.